Hi there and thanks for watching. This video is all about Delft clay sand casting silver and bronze jewellery. The next short clip is taken from a previous video to show an overview of what's involved. What I'll cover in this part one video will be how I make patterns, sometimes called models, that are copied in the casting process. Also tools and materials needed and how I made a casting flask, sometimes called a mould. Delft clay is used as a sand casting technique to produce items in gold, silver, bronze and copper, to name but a few. Let's first look at patterns I've made and found and what they can produce. This is the most complex pattern I've ever made. I first designed it on a computer, then printed it as a resist, enabling me to electro-etch this piece of copper in a salt solution. This is its copy cast in bronze. I made the pattern for this silver and amber sun pendant by gluing sunflower seeds to a disc of wood. The texture from the wood grain shows on the back. This is a similar pattern that will take a setting after casting, made by gluing shaped copper to a disc of wood. Here I've soldered copper wire together and then filled the back with wax before casting. And here it is, cast in bronze. Before casting this large leaf pendant, I filled in some of the wood grain on the back with wax to allow a clear space for hall marking. More than one pattern can be placed together in the clay to produce a single item like this acorn and twig. This is the result in bronze. Pistachios filled with wax produce a tasty pair of silver nuts. Pieces of shell cast well and have great texture. Here I've cast a smaller piece in bronze. This is another leaf glued to wood to produce silver earrings. Electrical wire is great for tying firm knots. Using wood is a very traditional material for making patterns, being strong, hard, but easy to carve and shape. Carving wax is great for producing intricate patterns, although somewhat weak when making delicate pieces. I've managed to cast a few times from this pattern before I broke it. It's always worth keeping a first casting as a new pattern, so now it's much easier to cast from this strong new bronze copy. Rejects are inevitable when casting. This one got reshaped into a smaller battle axe before being fitted with a wooden shaft and a silver eyelet. Small shells can cast really well once holes and undercuts have been filled. I like to use blue wax for this. Here it is in silver. Here again I filled this cowrie shell undercut with blue wax before casting in bronze, silver and copper. I use this blue carving wax a lot to make and modify patterns. It's a hard wax that cuts and carves well with a sharp knife or chisel. You can use a file on it and even cuts well with sandpaper. It softens and melts similar to candle wax when heated enabling you to shape and remould it if needed. This is another product I sometimes use for making patterns. It's a very soft and malleable modelling clay. It's finished by firing at a relatively low temperature in a domestic oven. Once cooled, it ends up being hard and plastic-like, perfect for casting. Taking this simple shape as an example, let's look at how patterns are designed so they can be pushed into the clay. Every pattern has an imaginary parting line. This is how far half of the pattern is first pushed in below the surface. Each pattern will be different and may have a number of options for where the parting line can be. 
These are a few of the options for this small piece of wood. Even a diagonal parting line could work with this simple shape. It could be pushed into the clay like this. Using this ingot of silver as an example, it has the same size and shape as the bit of wood. However, having texture on one surface, it can only be pushed into the clay in one direction. This would be texture side down, so the parting line would run the length of the thin side. Here's another example. I love casting pendulums, and this is its pattern. Here's another that's very similar. Both could be cast with parting lines running their lengths. However, only this one can be pushed into the sand point first, so the parting line runs around the circumference of the pattern. If I tried the same orientation with this first pattern, the clay would stick in these grooves and prevent it from releasing from the mould neatly. Let's now look at what's needed for this immensely satisfying process. So this is the star of the show. It's pre-prepared sand for casting called Delft clay. There are some cheap alternatives, but results in finish may vary in quality. I always go to a reputable source to avoid fake or counterfeit goods when buying Delft clay. It can seem a rather costly item, but it lasts a long time and is mostly reusable. It has a sticky and compactable consistency that holds its shape well without crumbling. The tacky texture comes from some of the ingredients being oil, clay and sand. This is easily washed off of hands with soap and hot water. Another vital product used when casting is borax powder. This is a flux that helps clean molten metals and prevents them sticking to your crucible. I use a small pinch just before pouring. I also use it to glaze and condition a new crucible before using for the first time. This one kilo pot will probably last me a lifetime. This is some of my Delft clay casting kit. Not all of it is essential, but having some of it to hand is needed. I use this to cut and chop my clay to loosen up any clumps. I'm not sure what it's called or what it's normally used for. If you recognize this and know anything about it, please let me know in a comment. A hot and fierce burner is important. I use either this oxygen and propane mixed burner or a large propane torch. I use these inexpensive ceramic crucibles. These two are brand new and need to be sealed and treated with borax before first use. They're held with some sort of long handle or tongs. This is one of my casting flasks that I've made. It comes in two parts. More details on this and how I made it later in the video. I use talcum powder as a parting powder to allow items to separate instead of sticking. These are my push rods. They are used to make holes through the clay. They work well when straight, smooth and with a blunt end. These vary in diameter from half a millimetre to five millimetres. Tubes also work well for cutting large holes. These vary from 6mm to 10mm in diameter. I always like to use these smoky shaded safety glasses when smelting and casting. They help see the molten metal without the bright glare. I use a burnisher to smooth and shape the clay when needed. Delft clay likes to be cut so I use this craft knife to carve the clay for a clean finish. The grain materials I use for casting are copper, sterling silver and bronze. I use a selection of soft and hard brushes from small to large. This is how I go about making my casting flasks that can be used in a vertical or horizontal position. Starting with a piece of box section steel tube, I first drill a large hole in one side. I then cut a short section off through the centre of the hole. 
Then I cut a second section the same length as the first. I then add some short tabs to one half. This allows both halves to come together easily and align accurately with no side movement once assembled. Well that's about it for this part one video. In part two I'll go into the details and options of how to pack the flask with clay. Also positioning patterns and how to prepare the mould for casting. Don't forget to leave me a comment if you know what that blade thing is. Also please help me out with any comments and feedback and by pressing the subscribe button. Thanks. You can click this link on the screen to see more of my creative stuff on my YouTube channel. Cheers.